80% of people globally are not really that engaged in the work that they do. From the research that I did and the secondary research from what other people have done as well is it boils down to three things. Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 155 and in this episode I'm joined by Aoife O'Brien. Aoife O'Brien is the founder of Happier at Work with the mission to accelerate the progress of women at work. She is passionate about creating a culture that supports women to thrive and helps organizations increase their bottom line while supporting female leaders to reach their full potential. She works with business leaders and employees to focus on workplace culture, cultivating balance and empowering leaders. Aoife has been featured by several national media platforms and public speaking events talking about imposter syndrome, fit, employee engagement, productivity and remote working. Her award-winning podcast, Happier at Work, features a combination of interview-based episodes as well as solo podcasting and has a global audience. She has lived and worked in Dublin, London, Perth and Sydney and has a Master's in Work and Organisational Behaviour and a Diploma in Executive and Life Coaching and a Certificate in Career Coaching. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about how you and your teams can be happier at work. So Aoife, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. So you have made a bit of a mission of yours, really, to help people be happier at work. And I think it's it, it, most people in life, if you ask them the question, you know, what do you want to be? They will say happy. And, and obviously work makes up such a huge amount of time of, of, of anybody's life. Um, where, where did that come from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, work, just to kind of reiterate that work takes up about a third of our life. So it is a huge amount of time. And I always like to think if you're happy at work, then you're you're happy in other aspects of your life as well. But really, and I think similar to yourself, well, it stemmed from a place of I wasn't happy at work. I was the kind of person who I always loved my job. I loved working. I was super ambitious. And until about 11 or 12 years ago, I found myself in a situation where I was like, what's going on here? Like, this is toxic. This is misogynistic. And I couldn't quite get my head around it because I'd always been in really amazing and supportive working environments and been hugely ambitious. So I loved Mm. what I did. And I still really enjoyed the day to day job. And I liked the people that I worked with, but it was really the leadership. And I called Mm. into question, what could I have done differently to make a better career decision for myself? And what could the organization that I worked for have done differently to retain me, to create this better working environment? So fast forward, a male colleague of mine was promoted to be my manager. It wasn't communicated to me at all. Mm. And that, you know, it, it ended in disaster. And I left that organization in less than 18 months. I spent about a year traveling and I came back to Ireland eventually after having spent some time in London prior to going to Australia. And when I came back to Ireland, it was like the same thing happened again. It wasn't quite as strong and it went on for about four and a half years. And I just felt I'm not thriving here. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Totally blamed myself. And I went on to do coaching qualification and a master's then in organizational behavior. And the the master's brought with it this light bulb moment of this is what's been going on. It's about fitting in at work and what that means and our sense of belonging and what we're here to do. So that's kind of been the evolution of how I got to where I am. And about five years ago, then I set up in business, uh, started out doing coaching, swiftly pivoted into calling myself happier at work and started the happier at work podcast as well to i was going to say to educate people but for me it's beyond just education it's about solving that problem of Mm. around 80 percent of people globally are not really that engaged in the work that they do and given that we spend so much time doing our work on a day-to-day basis my mission has become to challenge that and to change that and and to show people that they have an option, that they have a choice, and then to educate companies on how do we actually do that. And and that's what I'm really interested in unpacking today, because there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast 
that that are typically going to fit into one or two categories. They are either business owners and they have staff um, and they're either a business owner in themselves that isn't particularly happy. And we're going to get on to exactly what happiness is as, as part of your definition in a minute. And or they have employees that aren't happy and that has a huge cost all allocated to which we'll go into in a moment um, or there are people that are employees of companies that that are maybe happy or un unhappy um, so we're going to unpack that for, for the various different people that are listening to this but um, I, I think it's interesting because like you say you've you've gone on and, and, and done your degree in, in work and organizational behavior as well as all of the coaching side of things so you've come at it from so many different angles and I know that uh, you've you've worked with a lot of the the, the big big companies you know the coca Cola and the Unilevers and the Heinz. So you've, you've really seen it from all different spectrums. So I think it's going to be fascinating. But let, let's just start with, with one very simple question. What is happiness? Mm, really great question. So for me, what I wanted to understand was what was going on for me at work. And when I asked that question, when I was doing my master's, the response I got is it sounds like a fit issue. It sounds like you didn't really fit in where you were. So I became obsessed with this idea of fit. And so for me, that is the answer to happiness. And from the research that I did and the secondary research from what other people have done as well, is it boils down to three things. And that is values. So understanding what our values are, really clearly defining those. And if you think about this from an individual perspective, it's, you know, knowing what your own values are. And I know, Will, that you've talked about this on the podcast before. You're a huge advocate for understanding what our values are and knowing how to, to get to those. From the organization's perspective, having those values clearly defined, what do we stand for? What do we stand against? What does that look like? Mm. But is that the lived experience of the people who work here as well? Are they experiencing the behaviors that are associated with those values? So that's number one. Number two then is about needs satisfaction at work. And if you had asked me five, six years ago, Aoife, what are your needs? I'd be like, I have no idea what my needs are. I don't know what my needs are. Uh, I know when my needs are not being met because I feel really frustrated with what's going on. Now we can go into the different needs in a little bit more detail in a second, if you like. And then the third element is strengths and understanding, well, what are my strengths and how do I show up to work every day, working to my strengths? And I think oftentimes, we focus on our weaknesses and trying to overcome our weaknesses and trying to cover up what we're not good at. But how do we understand, well, what are we good at and how do we bring more of that into what we do on a day to day basis? So there's the, the three elements from the research I did, and I've sort of tacked on a couple of different pieces to bring those to life. And that is underpinned by psychological safety. So being safe to speak up and to challenge the status quo without any fear around retribution, without any fears around being ridiculed essentially at work and then overpinned by leadership because we need to have strong leaders in place in order to bring these concepts to life. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think it's, it, it, it's fascinating. So what, one of the things that, that I, so a friend of mine, Mo Gordat, he, he wrote a book called Soul for Happy and he's a definition yeah. for happiness. And I have a, a slightly, very slightly tweaked version that's based on his, which my definition of happy, which is a, a variation of his is, is just happiness is equal to or greater than expectations. But mm. most expectations aren't communicated, whether that's yes. with a family member, that's with a staff member, whether that's with a colleague mm. and the, those three different areas that you've broken down are, are quite interesting. I mean, we, we had a fascinating conversation, which, by the way, if you haven't listened to Happier at Work, definitely go and listen to it. I had the pleasure of being a guest and we had a fascinating conversation. In fact, the, the conversation with you is probably one of my my, my favourite conversations I've ever had. Um, we, it was a great conversation. So go and listen to that episode if you haven't already. Thank but, you. Um, the, the, what, what I want to unpack a little bit is the difference between a value and a need as far as you're concerned, mm. because yeah. a, another, so I'm big on values, as you've rightly said, for me, a, a value is a, a priority, but um, there's an, another friend of mine who I think I've had as a guest on the show, Nigel Risner, he talks about personal needs, but mm. um, yeah, how, how do you, how do you define the difference between a value and a need? Yeah, I'll come on to that now in a second, because I want to address this idea of expectations. Maybe we can talk about expectations later in the show, Will, because I'm so sure. fascinated by that entire concept. So values for me is more about the, the core of your being and how you like to show up in the world. 
and how you behave, how you demonstrate those behaviors. Needs are what you need in order to feel motivated, in order to feel like you're being successful and they're psychologically driven. So for me, the three needs that that I did my research on um, are three needs for motivation. They're, uh, it's called the, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's the um, self-determination theory is a theory of motivation. And those needs are autonomy, relatedness, and competence. So autonomy is a sense of choice and control over what you do and how you do it. As you can imagine during the pandemic, here's a whole load of autonomy. All of a sudden we're able to work from home and we're kind of more in control of what we're doing. Um, and I'll get on to that in a second, why that's maybe a bad thing. Autonomy, then relatedness is how you get along with the other people that you work with. Uh, I'm thinking more from a work context in this situation, but how you get along with the people that you work with, but also how do you relate what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, both to the bigger picture of what it is that the organization is trying to achieve, what the team is trying to achieve, but also how you relate what you do on a day-to-day -day basis with what your own life achievements, what you, know, what you want your life to be and what your own career goals are. And then competence is this feeling of being capable of doing the job. And the interesting thing, you know, coming back to this point on autonomy, suddenly you have all of this autonomy. It's actually not just about satisfying that need. It's about finding the balance between having too much autonomy, which I think a lot of people had during the pandemic and having not enough autonomy. So not enough autonomy, you feel like you're being micromanaged and you are being micromanaged. You're being told what to do, how to do it, when to do it. So mandates back to the office, all of that kind of thing, like that's taking away people's autonomy. And then having too much autonomy, which maybe during the pandemic, people did have a little bit too much autonomy. You're lacking direction and guidance because people are not sharing those expectations with you. These are my expectations that you should be performing to this level, you should be performing this amount of time. This is, and I love talking about expectations in relation to quality. You know, this is the, um, for this thing, this is to present within the team and it's okay if the quality is not there, if there's a typo on the slide, this is to be presented to a client so that the, you know, here's an example of what that quality looks like and it should take you four hours or it should take you two weeks or whatever that might be. And this is going to the CEO. So, well, we need to make sure that this is, you know, the, the kind of the top notch quality here. Um, but in addition to those three psychological needs, and, and by the way, they're universal needs. Everybody has these needs. There are additional unique needs that we might have that need to be satisfied as well. So things like status, things like having power, having variety in the work that you do, having stability in the work that you do. So they will be unique to each individual. Interesting. Very interesting. And then obviously you say about the strength side of things as well. Yeah. So I, I think um, from a, 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 a values piece, you absolutely nailed it in that so many people, they say I value X or I value Y, but pe what people get wrong is what you value is not in what you say, it's what you do. Mm. And everything you value is a reflection of what you're doing or have done. It's not what you say. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's very interesting. So it very much is behavioral. So that's where people talk about, Oh, well, I'm loyal and I've got integrity. They're, they're just social ideals. They're, they're not, in my opinion, they're not values because mm. there will be a, there'll be an area of your life where your behavior demonstrates that you're not loyal, but there'll be yeah. another area of your life that demonstrates that you are loyal. Yeah. And it's the thing that you are demonstrating that you are loyal is what you value and not so much in the other. So I think that's really yes. interesting. Yeah. What, what, what this particular... I was going to say in taking that into the workplace, then I think integrity is a value that a lot of companies talk about, and but they don't necessarily demonstrate that in their behavior. So the decisions that they made or that they make continuously are not based on integrity. So they're more aspirational. They say that that's what they have and maybe they aspire to be like that, but that's not how people are showing up on a day to day basis. No, very much so. And, 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 and there's, um, yeah, there's, there's just little things, isn't there in, in terms of personal needs of, of what's relevant for people, but that's also based on other things that, that I think that they value from time to time. So for example, um, 
if if the thing that's that's really important for somebody is my personal need is actually i really want to have my own desk when lots of people these days are because of the 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 remote working model are, are moving to hot desking and things like that yeah. it's it's just finding those things that are that are relevant so very very interesting in in terms of um you, you touched on it earlier, you know, 80% of, of, of people at work are, are not happy. And and I'm going to come at this from a business owner perspective. And it's something that I work really hard at. And I'll explain one of the tools that I use on a daily, weekly basis in, in a moment is that for most people, their biggest expense in their business is their staff. Mm. And if you haven't got staff firing at, at least 80% efficiency because these are going to be 100 percent. you know otherwise people are going to they're going to be redlining all the time it's not going to be conducive but the 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 if if, if people are that unhappy at work they're not they're not going to be efficient they're not going to be mm -hmm. effective you are literally throwing money down the the toilet as a result of having those people so one of the tools that I use, it's a very simple tool that I use with sort of my, my direct reports and then people do it with their people further down is on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you at the moment? And mm. we do that on a weekly basis because then we get a bit of a sense check of where that person's at personally as well. So if they've had a big breakup or the dog's just died and they're really feeling it, then we can have a little bit more empathy with that particular person, which we've found really forges a great bond with the team mm. and um and, and equally if they're not doing what they want to do if they're not doing what they, they, they they're capable of doing then then that becomes a a factor as well so from a business owner perspective it's very much about getting your your, your staff happier so that you get a better return on investment essentially yeah but obviously absolutely. from a from from a, a staff member's perspective it's about having more fulfillment in, in what mm. they do but what what's your opinion on the people that are in work in the moment, in, in a moment or in the moment, they're working in a moment, but they're not happy. How much of that do you think is down to that they're, they're just in the wrong role versus, or in the wrong role or the wrong company versus that there's just improvements that could be made within a company in your experience? I think there's, yeah, I think there's loads of different contributing factors and some of it comes down to what we touched on earlier was this idea of just being busy all the time and not being really clear on what needs to be done on a day to day basis or maybe the priorities change. And like you say, it could be the case that someone is in the wrong organization. So for me, the organizational fit is really important and that relates back to the values. So if on the one hand you're saying and, and I did work in a large global organization, and one of their values, this is the one I always think of because one of their values was simple. But if I wanted to send a marketing email locally in Ireland, I had to get approval from one of two people who were, you know, the gatekeepers, let's say, for this entire company of 40,000 people. One of two people had to give me approval to be able to send an email locally in Ireland to, you know, 500 clients or something like that. And it was anything but simple. It was the most bureaucratic organization I'd ever worked in. So I think finding that right organization where they mean what they say and how they show up and how they behave is totally related to what they talk about. So I think finding that is really important. And if we can kind of veer into this idea of like, how do you make sure that those are the right things? I think the pressure of, job interview situations both sides are showing up a little bit fake and saying like oh this is a brilliant place to work and you have to come here and and here are all of our values and the person who's looking for a job is like i'm i so need a job because i need to support my family i really need to get money so i'm going to put my best foot forward and i'm going to say what i need to say to get the job and i think this in the long term is not a great strategy i can understand it from the the individual's perspective, because if you need money and you need money now, you really need money now. But from an organization's perspective, it's about really making sure that you bring those right people in, first of all. Um, and then, so I kind of gone off on a little bit of a, <laughs> a little bit of a tangent from what you were saying, but how much of it is driven by that? I don't have any stats to necessarily back that up, but for me, a huge part of that is that the values piece and, organizations saying one thing but behaving in a completely different way 
Mm, yeah, no, I completely, completely, completely get that. I mean, if, if you're um, a business owner right now and you feel that the, the the culture in your business is maybe a little toxic or you're an employee in a company and you feel that the, the culture is a little bit toxic, I'm always wary of using labels like toxic and things. But um, what what do you think is the first thing that from both sides a business owner can do and that a, a staff member could do to rectify that? Yeah, so I think let's talk about from a business owner's perspective, first of all, and I think, first of all, congratulations for recognizing that, because oftentimes people don't see it or they don't want to admit it because it seems like some sort of failure on their part, on their part. But as your business grows, inevitably, you know, when you start a business, the values are going to be based on your own core values, whether you define them or not, it's going to be how you show up, how you behave and how you expect other people to behave as well. But as the team grows, that's going to get more and more diluted. And through no fault of your own, maybe it evolves to something that you didn't quite expect or you didn't want. So the first step is always to acknowledge that something is going on, that it's not right. Maybe the clue and this is a, you know, I had someone on the podcast talking about leading versus lagging indicators. This is a lagging indicator of a toxic culture is when people are leaving, like it's too late when people are leaving. You need to know about these things in advance. So I think there's a few different ways. And if you notice it, it's having those candid conversations with people and actually asking them, what do you think is going on here? Another great tool to use is a um, understanding why people stay. So a stay interview. We often talk about exit interviews, like why does someone leave an organization, but that might be different or the opposite of that might be different for why someone stays in an organization. Like, are they staying for a particular reason? You can also do a culture audit. So, you know, this is something that I do with my clients where we talk, we talk about like, well, what are the values? Are they the lived experience of the people in, in the workplace? And how do we bridge that gap if there is a gap between what they say the values are and what the experience of the employees is? So I think they're some of the things that as a business owner you can do. As an individual, I think it's tough to say that you'd be able to have that impact to make that change. But if you have a psychologically safe environment and it's okay to speak up and challenge how things are done, then maybe can you have a conversation with the business owner themselves, with a senior leader, with your own manager about that, you know, and it may be that things won't change. And that was the case for me. I did have these conversations and I ended up leaving because it just wasn't the right fit for me. It just wasn't a good place for me to be able to thrive. And I think if you're in a nice positive work culture, they'll be really happy if you go and you find something else where you can really, really thrive, whereas if you're in a toxic environment, you know that, you know, there's maybe not going to be a leaving card. There's not going to be uh, a congratulations or, or a big night out, a celebration for when you when you're leaving. Yeah, I um, I, th I think that's interesting, isn't it? If, if you if, if you really don't like something and you attempt to influence change to, to to address things then maybe it is that it's just not the right place so therefore you you change the environment yourself in in terms of what it is that you're you're doing in that instance um i i know for you people feeling empowered is something that's quite important you've got program mm -hmm. in, imposter to empowered but for people, not just in, in, in workplace, but this could be in a sporting environment or anything else, and, and, and they are feeling maybe um, disempowered and they are feeling a bit of a, an, an imposter, how, how do they know that's the case and what is it that they can do about it? For me, it's if you want to achieve something and you're not achieving it, I think that's kind of a clear sign of disempowerment that you're you're not taking control, you're not taking responsibility for your own outcomes. Um, and so oftentimes when we have imposter syndrome, we might not realize it because we are. And I'll, I'll think of an example from my own life as a business owner myself saying, I'm not going to put myself forward for that award because I'll never get it. So we're doing things that go against what it is that we want because we think we're not going to 
achieve it in some way it's because i i am a total fraud so how imposter syndrome typically shows up is we think we're lucky to be where we are we think we just got here by chance that there was no other options available to whoever is making decisions about like in specifically within our career for example uh, this feeling of being a fraud also so uh, that you feel like I'm going to be found out, other people are going to realize. So it's not just about doubting the abilities that you have, it's about other people finding out that you're not who you say you are, that, that mm -hmm. you know, you've somehow pulled the wool over their eyes and they think you're better than you really are. So they are kind of some of the signs that we have imposter syndrome and that we maybe need to address that. So the, again, similar to what I talked about in the values, it's about acknowledging, first of all, like you need to acknowledge that this is imposter syndrome and be aware that when you have imposter syndrome, your brain is going to tell you, <laughs> yeah, there is this thing called imposter syndrome, but Aoife, you really are an imposter. So we're telling ourselves these messages all the time. And so just being aware that that is imposter syndrome, that is imposter syndrome, that is like classic case. So first of all, acknowledge that it's there you can give it a name i call my imposter sandra so when i talk to my friend and i say i don't think i'm gonna put myself forward for that award she says are you speaking is that sandra speaking from a place of disempowerment or is that Aoife speaking from a place of empowerment and you know putting my own best foot forward in that scenario so giving it a name, we can acknowledge what it's saying to us as well. Like what are the actual words and how do we identify where that stems from as well? Because oftentimes it stems from childhood. It could be a teacher that said something to you. It could be a parent or a caregiver that has said something. And these words reverberate throughout our life and they show up all the time. So what is that imposter actually saying? And then there's techniques that you can use to build up your own self-belief. You can get feedback from people. You can write down your achievements. And really, at the end of the day, it's about taking action. So mm -hmm. it's not just about talking and planning and waiting till you feel confident. It's about taking small actions towards what it is that you want to achieve and building confidence from that. And when you have setbacks on that journey, it's about learning from those setbacks. So what might I do differently the next time? What went well? What could be improved? All of these things contribute to moving past and managing and overcoming imposter syndrome. Very interesting indeed. Very interesting indeed. And, and I know you actually have a quiz where people can find out what type of imposter they are. So yes. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I mean, it's quite quite a, a leading question really, isn't it? Because then that's assuming that everybody's an imposter. If they take the quiz, they're going to be one of the five. But um, I, 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 well, yeah, that's or, a good or point. One of them actually, that you're so. not an imposter. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. So, well, 70% of people from research, 70% of people have experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their career. And from research that I've done myself, that goes up to 90% of the participants in my survey. And I did specifically ask for people who have never experienced imposter syndrome to take the, to take this survey that I created myself as well. So if you're listening and those what I'm saying resonates with you, like you feel like a fraud, you feel like you're going to get found out, you just got lucky to be where you are, do go and check out the quiz. It's based on Dr. Valerie Young's book and her different archetypes. There's five different types. Uh, I won't go into a huge amount of detail about them now, but there's five different types. And I certainly can relate to at least three of those different types when it comes to imposter syndrome. So I'd be curious to know what other people do. And you'll find the quiz at impostersyndrome.ie. That's imposter with an E at the end. So I think some American people spell it, spell it with an O, impostor. But this is imposter with an E at the end and uh, .ie as well for Ireland. Very good. And um, if, if people want to find out more about being happier at work, obviously you've got a podcast. Where else can people find out about you and connect with you yeah. and, and, and listen to the podcast? I would say if you are listening to the podcast now, if you're watching on YouTube, then go and check out Happier at Work, the podcast. That'd be the first. And first place I will send you is Will's podcast episode. Since you're listening to Will's podcast now, um, definitely go and check out that episode on Happier at Work. 
I'm really active on LinkedIn. So if anyone wants to connect with me there, that's a, a, another really great place to start. And I will spell my name because it's Irish and not everyone gets the spelling, but it's Aoife and it's spelled A-O-I-F-E. Uh, O'Brien, which I think is kind of standard enough. Hopefully I don't have to spell that out, but it's O apostrophe B-R-I-E-N. So uh, LinkedIn is a great place or my website, happieratwork.ie. Amazing. Well, guys, if you want to go and uh, find out more about uh, Ether, then definitely go and check that out. And uh, I do recommend listening to the podcast because I really enjoyed the one that we did. And uh, I'm sure you've had many, uh, many other fantastic guests as well. So thank you so much for joining us. For everybody that's been listening, um, thank you. And uh, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share it with anybody that you think could benefit from it. And also make sure that you hit subscribe so that you get to get the new episodes as soon as they're released.